What's up, Coder Byte? Welcome back to another Data Structures and Algorithms video. I'm Elizabeth, and I've been gone for quite a few months now. I haven't posted a new video in a while. If you're wondering why, I'll be totally honest with you. I got kind of bored with the same old interview question over and over and over again. So for 2023, I know we're already kind of way into the year. April, but never too late to start. We are sending some amazing content your way. Today, I'm going to talk a little bit about my own personal journey. I recently quit my job and I am in the interview process myself trying to land my next tech job. So today I'm going to tell you a little bit about that decision, how I've gone about going through this interview challenge process, whatever. Um, and yeah, get a pencil and paper, get ready to take some notes. We're sending some great tips and tricks your way all about how to land that next gig. Outside of that, some general Coder Byte announcements. I'm here, I got some new cool clothes, I got an awesome green screen behind me, and once again, I'm trying to make this channel as exciting as possible, not only for you guys, but for me as well. And part of that is challenging yourself. So I've spent the last few weeks learning how to use this new green screen, using a, a new film editing software to make better and better videos for this community. Get excited, here's the video. All right, everybody. So why did I quit my high paying, pretty sweet tech job that I already had? I debated back and forth whether or not how much I was going to share about what went into that decision for me personally. So I am gonna share a little bit about it, but please, I hope that you withhold your judgment, judgment of me, judgment of my company, because everybody is really trying to do their best. I truly believe that. So let's get into it. Why did I quit my pretty awesome tech job? First and foremost, when I started that job, I realized pretty quickly that I couldn't stand the actual work I was doing. I was doing, it was a Series C company, and something I found about these kind of Series C startups is that it's a little bit of a bloated situation. A lot of what we were doing was dealing with all of the tech debt that their first initial team accrued when they were starting out in that series seed stage, series A, series B situation. All the tech debt that that original team accrued, and then that original, that original team kind of flew the nest and were no longer around. So they hired a bunch of us engineers to come in and kind of rework the system and ultimately what I was spending a lot of my time doing was writing a ton of documentation. Documentation that that original team never wrote in the first place. So lesson number one, no matter what stage you're at in your journey, if you are working on any code whatsoever, write that documentation. It's probably the worst part of our jobs as engineers, at least my, me personally, I kind of hate it. It's something I really don't look forward to. I'm not great at it. I became a software engineer because I didn't want to write any English. And yet, as software engineers, we almost constantly have to be writing that really good documentation, not only for your future you know, employees and people you're working with, but for your future self. How often have you written code and then gone back to it a few months later, a few years later, and you're like, I don't know what I was thinking, and I don't know how this works anymore. And you kind of have to reinvent the wheel. Don't get yourself into that situation. Get good at writing that documentation. Develop that skill and use it early on, no matter what stage code you're writing. If you're starting a project, if you're in the middle of a project, if you're entering a project that you didn't start and you're seeing that there's a lack of documentation, start to document because slowly you will have documentation that can support your code. So that's number one. I kind of came into this job and for the most part, I was spending a lot of time reading other people's code and documenting instead of writing my own code and building my own features and you know awesome apps and products, which is ultimately why I became a software engineer. That's number one. Number two, I was spending a lot of time configuring things, right? That original team created this really, truly amazing software package. 
and so much of building new features and products and onboarding new customers with our specific, you know, code that we had written was actually just a lot of layers of configuration. Now that's great, but I want to kind of build my own features and actually get my hands dirty coding new features and really creating. It's another thing I really love about this job is that opportunity to create something new every single time I sit at my computer. So that was kind of number two. I really was kind of not really excited about the work I was doing there every day. So why did I stay there an entire year? In hindsight, I kind of wish I didn't because over the year, I learned a lot of lessons, but I don't really feel like I progressed in my engineering expertise. Well, I don't know if that's entirely true. I think that my experience at this company was actually an experience that I'll use for the rest of my life in this industry, kind of how to deal with software that someone else has written. That being said, I stayed there a year. So what kind of was the straw that broke the camel's back and how did I last a whole year there? The reason I really actually loved my job was the culture of the company itself. I thought the culture was world class. I loved going to work every day simply because I loved my team. We worked so well together and I think we were a very high performing team. We got a lot done in a short amount of time and we had fun doing it. So that really kept me around and was good enough for me. I was getting my paycheck. I was lightly coding. I was documenting an enormous amount. It was good enough. So what was that straw that broke the camel's back? So I do want to talk about this a little bit, that we are currently in a very interesting place in our economy. Things seem to be going downhill. People are talking about a potential recession. Companies are worried. They're doing giant layoffs. They're trying to extend that runway. And what I saw happening at my company was there was a series of firings that they made. Um, they didn't call them layoffs. They called them performance-based firings. And it wasn't only at my company. I've talked to lots of people in the, in the industry and people are kind of seeing the same pattern where companies are firing what seem like high performing, you know, members of the, of the workforce. And they're saying that it's because of performance. And why I think that's happening is companies are trying to do way, way, way too much. My company set outlandish goals for this year. They wanted our team to stay the same size and do double the amount of work that we were able to complete in 2022. Really kind of impossible. And in my mind, setting us up for failure. And I didn't want to stay somewhere where I was going to be told that it was my fault that I couldn't meet those impossible goals. So at the end of the day, what happened was they continued to fire people around me, people I really loved working with, and particularly they fired my product manager. She was one of the best product managers I've ever worked with. And now this is the piece of the story that I debated sharing on this channel. Because again, I don't want you to judge my company because like I said, they're doing the best they can and they're trying to just get by right now. But they fired my, my product manager our beloved product manager, the person who really gave direction to our team and helped us become such a high performing team. And she was one of the only people of color at my company. She is black. And this is something I don't, you know, we kind of talk around in this industry, but we don't address directly. Why is it that when I go to work, I am surrounded by white men? And now I'm a woman, I'm a queer woman, and slowly the industry is starting to have more women in the engineering part of the organization. But we're still not seeing a lot of color. It's a lot of white people, maybe a lot of, you know, other white appearing races, but there is not a lot of people of color in our industry. And that is deeply sad to me. And I looked at that decision and I saw that this product manager that I had come to know and love and really enjoy working with was being let go and told that it was her fault, that she couldn't do the job of three people. She was asked to do the job of three people. She probably could have had a team of people working for her to help accomplish the goals that they were trying to have us accomplish. And it really rubbed me the wrong way. I felt that as a person of color in our industry, she should have been given 
all the support and all the tools to really be successful, not told that it was her fault that she couldn't accomplish those impossible goals. And at the end of the day, that's why I decided to take this giant leap of faith and quit my job, even though the economy is what it is. And I knew that it was going to be a challenge for me to find my new job. I gave up that stability of having a paycheck and I decided to kind of dive headfirst into this job hunt. Now, again, this is not a video all about blasting this, what happened at my last job. And I really invite you, please don't try and find out what company I worked for. It was a small tech company, small startup, ultimately doing really, really good work. And again, I think that what they're trying to accomplish is wonderful. I finally was at a company that I really believed in the mission and I still do. So please don't try and go and find out where I came from. Just take my words and hear what I'm saying and try and use this as lessons for your own journeys. Today, I'm going to talk about all, everything I've learned interviewing myself. I've been looking for a job now for about two to three weeks. I quit my job about three weeks ago, maybe two and a half weeks ago. And I have learned an enormous amount in this job hunt. I've gotten many jobs over the course of my career, and each time I look for a job, the process is slightly different, but I do feel like I've kind of honed in on a process that works. So today, I want to talk all about how to land that next job, and not only the next job, but all the jobs that you will hopefully get in your entire career. And not just any job, a job that you love, a job that's really going to serve you, and a job where you can do good work. So. Let's get into what I've learned in my journey so far. How did I begin my job hunt? So I was actually in Mexico at the time. You all know I love Mexico and I was in my beloved Tulum when I quit my job. So highly recommend if you're gonna quit your job and take this leap, do it from somewhere that you have a lot of strength and support because it made the whole entire process and decision a lot easier because I got to go to the beach after having all these really difficult conversations with my company. But how did I begin my job hunt? I remember sitting in a cafe with internet in Tulum, Mexico, and I kind of was like, what now? How do I move forward? The first thing I did was I updated my resume. Now, resume is a tool that everyone needs when they're looking for a job. And so here are some tips on how to make your resume stand out. I was recently asked what my opinion is on multi-page resumes, and I gave the advice that I think, throw the rest of your resume out. You really only need that first page. The point of a resume is not to explain everything you've ever done and all the reasons why you should be hired. The point of a resume is to get your foot in the door. You want someone to be able to glance at your resume and right away see that you are a valuable candidate. The rest can be discussed on the phone or in person when you're on, at your onsite. So how do I structure my resume? Like I said, I always make it just one page and I have a giant section all about my side projects. If you haven't done a side project, highly suggest you get on that because side projects are super impressive for employers. Why? Because it shows that you actually really are passionate about what you do. You're not only doing it when you're getting paid, but you're doing it for free, basically just to better your expertise. And you know, it's also a really great way to show off. Use those new technologies. Do something you're curious about. Try and learn something new with the side project as a vehicle for that learning. Because I'm telling you, as someone who looks at resumes, as someone who has offered my resume many times to try and land jobs, that is the most impressive thing you can show a future employer. So that's number one. Have a giant section of side projects, or as big as you can make it. Next, you know, have your experiences. Again, you don't need to write everywhere you've ever worked. I would say, make sure you have your last job, you know, where are you coming from? Because employers want to know what, what's the last thing you did with your life before you're entering this new job. So make sure you have that last experience. And then I would say, pick another two or three really, you know, solid experiences that you've had that can truly showcase your talents. Make sure in your keep your bullet points nice and concise 
and Google, you know, good words to use in a resume because that's what I did. You want to use words like championed, captained, led, architected, all these words that show action, show leadership, show ownership, show expertise, you know, and you want to also have those bullet points be really specific. You want to say, I built a project that saved my company hundreds of thousands of dollars. I built a project that changed our workflow from 40 engineering hours to 15 seconds of a script automatically executing. I want to show that I drastically improved our CI CD pipeline so that every engineer could spend less time deploying their code and more time writing their code. Stuff like that. Interesting things that, again, at a glance, very obviously show your talents. So that's basically all I have to say. My resume is extremely, extremely simple. I didn't use any fancy template. It's all just text on a, on a page. Again, well laid out with the right things bolded, the right things italicized, my name and my contact information and my GitHub link really clearly located at the top of the page. And, you know, make it something that at a glance really showcases your best talents. Next up, let's talk about an amazing tool that most of us use, LinkedIn. I don't ever log on to my LinkedIn unless I am looking for a job. So the next thing I did was I dusted off that old LinkedIn profile and I updated it more or less to basically mirror my resume. I wanted to put all of those experiences, those skills, all that cool stuff on my LinkedIn profile. And of course, after you update your LinkedIn profile, change your LinkedIn profile to open to new positions. I don't know if that's the official terminology they use, but it's a feature where you can let recruiters and other companies know that you are interested in new jobs. There's an awesome feature that you can hide this from people in your current network at your current company if you didn't you know, jump ship like I did totally and you want to keep it a secret that you're looking for a new job, but really use LinkedIn as a tool for your advantage. It's a wonderful network where recruiters are looking constantly for good engineers. So go dust off that old LinkedIn profile and make it look good. Next, I reached out to old employers, old coworkers, people I've worked with in the past, people who hopefully you have impressed in the past, people who want to work with you again. I reached out via email, via LinkedIn, depending on what contact information I had. And I started having lots of conversations with people I've worked with, asking them for their advice, asking them if their companies were hiring, asking them if they knew anybody who was hiring. This is a great, great, great thing to do when you're looking for a job. It helps to get your foot in the door at companies you might not necessarily have an in for. And it also helps just get that conversation flowing, start to hone in on your story. Why are you looking for a job? What are you looking for in your next position? Stuff like that. Sometimes it feels a little strange to say, hey, I'm looking for a new job. Have anything to offer me? But it's really normal and something that I really suggest that you do right at the beginning of your job search. My next greatest tip to you all, go get on coderbyte.com. Practice those algorithms. Go look at old YouTube videos. Really do your work. Study for those interviews. I hate when I have totally impressed a company and it comes to the technical screen and they're like, solve this complex algorithm thing. And I'm like, uh, I don't know how to do that, right? Because we don't actually do those algorithms at our day jobs. That's that tricky part about getting that this t tech job that we're all lusting after. How do we get it? We got to practice that skill of algorithms. I highly suggest you get on websites like HackerRank, Boo, Coderbyte, Boo, um, and just all online. Just practice, practice, practice. This is a skill that you actually can learn. So do the work, spend some time. I've personally been logging into Coderbyte every day for an hour a day. Get those algorithm skills, muscles flowing, you know? Take out that toolbox we've discussed in a million videos previous to this one and go, go, go.
This next tip is possibly the most fun part of the entire journey thus far. I'm calling it craft your story. Now I sat down with one of my best friends and greatest mentors, Nis. He works at Coderbyte with me and you know, our great family here at Coderbyte. And he one time said, I was asking him, what do you do Nis? And he said, I'm a storyteller. Now that is my greatest advice to all of you, become storytellers. And especially when you're looking for a job, craft your story. Try and hone in on why am I looking for another position? What have I been up to the last year? What am I looking to do in the next year, five years, 10 years of my life? What are my key values that I won't compromise on? This is a really, really integral part of your search, understanding who you are and what you can offer to any company, any recruiter that you have a conversation with, really anybody at all. This is extremely important, not only in your job search, but in life understand where are you coming from? Where are you going? Craft that story, be a storyteller. For my next tip, this is already as you are getting those interviews, starting to schedule those first initial phone screens, I suggest make a spreadsheet, track what companies you're talking to, who is your contact at that company? What stage of the interview have you scheduled? some notes, maybe a link to the job posting, stuff like that. Because hopefully with all this advice, you're going to start getting lots and lots and lots of interviews. And you don't want to be scrambling. You don't want to be sending thank you notes. Hey, thanks Sarah for taking the time to talk to me and then sending that thank you note to Jason at the wrong company. That's awkward. And honestly might get you taken out of the pipeline, which is kind of absurd. So track all of those interviews that you have scheduled in some, you know, however you want to do it. I've done it using a Google sheet. It's pretty simple, but you know, just to get a layout kind of bird's eye view of what is your process? Who are you talking to? What stages are you up to? All that sorts of stuff. All right, everybody. I have thrown a lot of information at you today. I hope you're still watching. This is my final tip. And I know I already said this crafting your story is possibly the funnest part, but I actually think this is the funnest part. Dress to impress. Don't show up to your interview looking like a slob, but also don't show up to your interview wearing a suit and tie. I one time interviewed someone who showed up in a suit and tie and I was like, I wonder if that's a red flag. Um, unless you're interviewing at like Goldman Sachs or Bloomberg, which, you know, go do your thing. But other than that, look good. You know, even if you're doing video calls, Zoom calls, virtual on sites, don't show up in your t-shirt and shorts, gym shorts. Come on, everybody. We all show up to work that way, but that doesn't mean you should show up to your interview looking like a slob. So get some cool clothes look good, look presentable, take a shower, look like you're someone you want to hang out with. You know what I'm saying? I love this part of the job search. I love kind of organizing my wardrobe, buying new clothes specifically for interviews, just showing up and looking good. It's a great, great, great thing. Again, not just for getting a job, but for life. Dress to impress. And that's a wrap for today's video, folks. I think I gave you a lot of information. I hope that it helps you in your job search. I hope that you all land that next gig, your dream job. I'm wishing you all luck. Please send luck my way, because like I said, I am in this process together with you. Hopefully, we're gonna be working towards a better tomorrow. We should all, you know, merit a job that makes us money, happiness, satisfaction, fulfillment. And yeah, that's all I got for you today. So please continue to check back on this channel for more amazing content coming your way. I haven't quit Coder Bite. I'm just getting started. 2023 is gonna be a great, great year. So stay tuned and I'll see you in the next one. Bye everybody.